Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear friends and colleagues. My name is Bobo Lowe, and I have the great honour and pleasure to be moderating what I think will be a most interesting and lively debate on an absolutely crucial uh, subject in today's world, that of media and politics. Now, to discuss this admittedly very broad subject, we have a most distinguished panel. Let me introduce them briefly to you. Uh, to uh, my immediate left is Pilar Bonnet, a correspondent for El País. Uh, to her left is Rina Kalurand, who is policy advisor at the Estonian Ministry for Foreign Affairs. To her left, in the middle, is Nathalie Nougered, editorial mem board member and columnist for The Guardian. To her left is Kadri Leek, senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And finally, to the far left, is Sylvie Kaufmann, uh, editorial director of Le Monde. Um, now, as I mentioned, it's an extraordinarily broad subject. And so when uh, Liena and Ina suggested I should moderate this panel, I was thinking, well, what is the best way to try and maybe focus the discussion a little bit in the next two hours? And so what I wanted to do was put a number of questions to our panelists here, but even more importantly, to you in the audience, because I really hope that you will be active participants, because these are issues that concern us all. So let me run through some questions for you. My first question is really, what responsibility does the media bear today for the polarization of politics in Western democracies and for the rise of nationalism and populism? And really, Looking a little bit ahead, how will this media, or how might this media, influence or shape Europe's political future? My second question is even more broad, if that's possible, which is, are liberal values sustainable in increasingly fragmented, polarised democratic societies? And what can and should the media do to support such values? Or is, do you think that the media's responsibility is merely to report the facts? Are we living, my third question, are we living in a post-truth world in which there's no such thing as a truth? There are just, there's my truth, there's your truth. Truth, truth like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. So we don't have truth so much. What we have today are narratives. And this leads on naturally to the next question of, is the idea of impartiality or even-handedness, say like in the BBC, is that, a, is that a fiction? Is that an illusion? And because one criticism of the BBC in the UK is that it introduces a false equivalence between truth and lying, between climate change science and climate change denial. So how does, does even-handedness actually distort the debate about vital issues? And this leads naturally to my next question, which is, what is, for reporters, for you, what is the appropriate balance between comment, analysis, advocacy, like promoting certain views, and just reporting of the facts, reportage. And how do you see this working in practice? Now, in Western countries, we hear a lot about foreign disinformation, not just from Russia, by the way, from China, from authoritarian regimes around the world. But is this claim about foreign disinformation, is this just an excuse to mask the, and, and forgive, if you like, the shortcomings of Western democracies? So in other words, in the West, we're not bothered, we're saying if there's a problem, it's not our problem, it's that it's being distorted by nasty foreign media outlets like RT and Sputnik. What do you think? And 
we live in an age of social media. So what is the role of social media in democratic societies? And how far should they be controlled or, the, the buzzword of today, made accountable? And I want to go to, uh, because we have a, an all-women's panel, and it, 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 I, I want to bring this issue up. Do you think that the media in the West or in other non-West, do they apply a double standard to male and female politicians? And does this constrain the participation of more women, as well as people from ethnic, religious, and cultural minorities in political life. And finally, looking ahead, how do you see the media landscape, not just in the West, but, but around the world, how do you see the media landscape, media culture, evolving over the next decade, or maybe even decades? And will the distinction between free media and controlled media become increasingly artificial and irrelevant. So, Pilar, let me start with you. Shall we sit, you sit, sit down. Yes. Sit down. Yeah, that's fine. Well, Bobo has to talk so many Just questions. Me. I'm afraid it's impossible to answer to all of them, uh, certainly, and I'm, I'm not even going to try. I, um, I am probably going to sound very simplistic and certainly old fashioned and classical. I still think that there is such a thing as journalism, which is defined by the search of truth, not on one side or on the other side, but uh, try to get uh, uh, as close to the truth with its multiple faces uh, as you can, um, based on your capacity, your knowledge, and your, uh, and your ability to put uh, things together. Um, well, that's my way of, of un understanding this profession. Not that these complex things do not exist, but it's a question of methodology. I still think that this basic principle is valuable in a very complex world, which is full of fake news, of plots to put you in and at the service of different ideas, of all kinds of narratives, so uh, of new technologies. So what that means basically is that you have to find the tools to uh, go on practicing what is classical journalism in a complex environment. As an example, uh, shoemakers, yeah? Shoemakers will exist so long as we have uh, food. So if uh, we have a, a crave for the truth, journalists as people who try to look uh, for the truth will be necessarily necessary in that uh, in that society so there is no difference between a shoemaker and a journalist and shoes can be made in a conveyor shoes can be made by by hand and by order so everyone has to position himself or herself in this uh, uh, way of making shoes uh, some people make very, very expensive shoes News um, craftsmanship is very expensive for, for news and for shoes. So that's my, my basic position. Yeah? Um, in this uh, complex world, I think we have to find alliances. Alliances to, um, um, of people who see journalism in the same way and who is interested in cleaning this profession from the... Um, 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 the effect of other professions like a, a, a public relation um, a specialist, uh, propagandist, and other, and other people of that kind. And in that respect, we have already uh, different uh, uh, examples. I think some people here are going to speak about them of uh, organizations who practice uh, research journalism. Um, let's say uh, to research the Panama Papers, or the, the, the fall of um, the destruction of the Malaysian uh, plane in, in Donbass, or the, the, political, uh, the, the, the Chinese political about uh, minorities and Uyghurs, or I, I never practiced uh, uh, that in group except for WikiLeaks, uh, uh, which was a very specific experience. And why I rem what I remember from it, uh, as uh, I, re I remember good things fr uh, from it, but also very bad. For instance, the, the way uh, contacts and sources were exposed to repression 
and uh, lack of responsibility for those sources on, on one way, and a limited, um, um, limited um, sample of media uh, to operate in, because they were only the, the papers of the um, uh, American administration, and there was little work done outside and in connection with that. So the, that was, uh, for me, a, a critical thing. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I had a problem because I talked too much. and. I, um, um, well, well, my environment. Uh, I am working in the uh, in the former Soviet Union, and um, um, my environment is uh, what uh, is around me at different uh, at different levels, and um, I see different problems at this at this time, uh, which are I made a list of of, of them. If we uh, talk about Russia, um, we have an increasing number of obstacles to make uh, our work. Uh, some people mentioned them, legislation <clears throat> uh, to control f uh, Facebook, uh, um, and, and, uh, foreign agents, um, which can now be, uh, um, uh, we can be made foreign agents, it's, uh, uh, foreign agencies, uh, agents. There is no specification in the Russian law whether foreign agents concerns only uh, Russian citizens or foreign citizens too. And um, the control of uh, internet, the control of, uh, of the, the software of telephones, and the control of uh, history, for instance. Uh, I want to mention a case. Uh, in 2007, <clears throat> uh, we had a series, a summer series, uh, devoted to uh, places where um, there has been uh, something happened in history. So I decided I was going to work on the, the two, 200 years of the Tilsit pace. Took uh, um, my book of uh, War and Peace in my, uh, in my uh, backpack and went to Kaliningrad uh, to work on, uh, on 200 years of uh, Tilsit peace. And I went to the uh, town of Sovietsk, which in the past was the Tilsit, at the border with uh, uh, Lithuania. And, um, uh, and everybody was depressed and sad there because they they have been working uh, for several years to make a reconstruction of the Tilsit peace uh, between France and and, uh, and Russia. And at the last moment, they got a letter from a high official at the foreign minister saying that uh, it was not recommended to celebrate the Tilsit peace uh, uh, with a reconstruction because it, it portrayed Russia in a very bad uh, light. So what was going to be my summer, my, my summer story became a story about uh, how it was impossible to celebrate or to rec uh, uh, um, remember history because the history was not good for, uh, for, the, for the country. Yeah? And um, that's one, one, one example which con concerns um, history. And because we are in Berlin and this is the th uh, 13th anniversary of the fall of the wall, I, what, I want to remember that uh, there was not only uh, um, the fall of one wall. Many walls have been um, erected after, after the Berlin Wall fall. And uh, I can see it my, in my work, because uh, if in the past you could travel to Moscow, uh, from Moscow to Kiev directly, and it, it was one hour and 10 minutes, now to go from Kiev uh, uh, to, to Moscow and vice versa, you have to go via other countries. Uh, and that has made Minsk an international hub where you can buy cheese and uh, sausages when you go to, uh, to, uh, to Russia, for instance. Yeah? Or if you go to Crimea from Moscow, which is two hours in a plane, then you cannot enter the, uh, Ukraine and you, cannot, you won't be able to cover uh, Crimea. Or even worse, if you go to, to Donbass, via Russia, then you cannot uh, go to Ukraine again. But to go to Donbass via, via Kiev, you need uh, several weeks, because you need the permission of the um, um, security, the Minister of uh, uh, Defense. And then uh, you have to go to the, uh, to the control uh, line and, uh, on the side of Kiev, to the control line on the side of the separatists. And also, the, you need their permission, which is not easy other. So it turns the whole thing, places which are very close are very far away, in, in fact, uh, as far as working is uh, concerned. So I don't agree with, uh, someone said that, uh, here that everything is uh, transparent, uh, 
in that space. I don't agree. Uh, things are not uh, uh, transparent at all. And the last uh, thing I would like to, uh, to mention is that maybe uh, this environment is not... Um, uh, is more fragile than we think, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, an example of that uh, is that there is a still sense of humor. Not, not long ago, I saw a wonderful uh, sketch, humor sketch, uh, in uh, one of the Russian channels about the sovereign internet. Uh, people dressed in military uh, clothes, uh, making a parody of the whole sovereign internet, and it was so funny, it made me... Uh, think of the humor um, we had in Spain during the time of Franco, which uh, was also very funny and uh, there is some connection. For instance, when they, um, they made fun of, of Shoigu and the Ministry of Defense, and they, they talk about Shoigu uh, Google, for instance. Yeah? They, yeah. It, it has to be seen. So I am not pessimist, uh, but uh, uh, it is not an easy situation. Thank you very much, Pilar. Look, you mentioned, you argue that there is a truth, and you also say so long as there is a, a demand, a, a need for truth, then there'll be a need for journalists, and it's no different to any other supply and demand profession. You talk about alliances of journalists, a sort of cleaning journalism. Uh, cleaning the profession, making the distinction between proper journalism on the one hand and PR and propaganda on the other. But I've got to ask you, how practically are you going to achieve this? Because it's not even a question of uh, China Daily or RT or Sputnik, but take, take uh, the United States or or the UK. In the United States, you have the problem of Fox News. In uh, the UK, you have certain outlets like the Daily Telegraph that perpetuate lies about Brexit, for example. Um, so these are supposedly, well, certainly Daily Telegraph is, uh, these are supposedly respectable news outlets run by proper journalists, and yet they are peddling in a sense, a propaganda that's no less false than the kind of propaganda that's being put out by outlets such as Sputnik or, 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 or CCTV9 or whatever. So how are you going to... What practical measures do you have in mind to clean up the profession of journalism? Well, it's the same for every profession. You have to start by yourself. Uh, uh, at my level, uh, we, we have trade unions, we have different things, we have law, uh, laws, we have uh, 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 courts, but uh, we have to start uh, by, by the daily fight for one word. The daily no or yes, or, uh, I see it that way, and this is not going to publish, uh, to be published. Uh, and, uh, and another thing is education, general education. And when I speak about the truth, it is not a, a dogma or a religion. Uh, uh. It's not the truth, the truth. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, a truth with many different uh, uh, um, uh, sides. Yeah? It's a complex thing. Maybe we'll see a part of the truth. Maybe it's only um, uh, just a, a vector in the direction of the truth. And one has to see piece by piece in the same way as there is not a, um, a um, how do you say, um, presumption of uh, innocence mm -hmm. or a presumption, presumption of, cul cul uh, of gu uh, guilty, sure. um, I, I don't want to talk about Western journalists because I think journalism is journalism everywhere. And I see colleagues of mine in Russia every day who uh, try to get uh, their message or their truth through uh, among the lines. Uh, maybe they won't do that 100%, but they try. And the, these people exist all over the world. So this is universal, the, 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 the wish for truth, the wish uh, to, for democracy, for uh, freedom. They are in every culture. And I, I could see it in myself in the Caucasus in different, in different places. So I am convinced that there are some universal values. The way they, they, they are okay. conform is different everywhere. So okay. no, no general judgment about anything. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, Rina, you work um, almost in the eye of the storm. You're under pressure from politicians, but you're also under pressure 
from public scrutiny. So how do you, as a essentially a public servant, how do you marry these contradictions in uh, what is a, an important position, but also a highly sensitive position as policy advisor in the foreign ministry? Thank you very much, Bobo. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity for being here again in this very distinguished panel. I actually uh, thought that I'm really an odd man or odd woman out because uh, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I am just a consumer of journalism or media, and I, I hope that during the years I have uh, learned to make a difference between good and bad journalism. But then I, um, I, I started to think that what this added value of me being in this panel would be, and I, I thought that maybe me as a civil servant um, <coughs> Really, I, I have a different perspective. And um, I might even say that, uh, that civil servants uh, are in probably the most difficult situation, especially uh, in, uh, in the situ sort of a global <coughs> political situation that we are having in, in different countries, not only in Europe, but also in the United States and everywhere, where populism uh, is uh, on the rise and is, is really um, coming in through the doors to, to every, every political space. And uh, Estonia is no exemption here. And uh, I, um, I very much liked your sort of uh, comparison with the shoemakers, because really it, it is very good to have different kinds of uh, shoes and different kinds of shoemakers. And it's the same with, uh, with good newspapers. I mean, it's, it's very good to have different views, very balanced and informed views um, of different issues. Unfortunately, this is not the case, and especially this is not the case in small countries. Um, because I think um, what is going on in Estonia, and I, I guess this is true for several other European countries is a sort of very emotional ideological war and it's basically there are only two sides fighting with each other those who think they are more liberal and the other ones who think they are conservative and preserving everything that is worth preserving uh, without actually thinking that by preserving this they are destroying more and uh, by doing this I think that they are really using uh, too much of the extremes and uh, these extremes in, in public space, in media, are inevitably uh, also coming to, to the ministries and we, we have to deal with this, for example, in, in foreign policy. So many domestic issues today determine uh, our foreign policy and especially if you have a conservative government with a populist uh, uh, strong populist uh, sort of brand, then um, it is sometimes very difficult for us to, to give good explanations. And um, for example, I think in Estonia, uh, when we talk about media, then um, there are not, let's say, okay, there are good journalists, but the expert views are really in shortage. And mm. sometimes um, the experts uh, cannot be found anywhere else than in the ministries. Uh, again, okay, we are allowed to comment on certain issues uh, that are sensitive, like immigration or minority protection and LGBT movements uh, everywhere. But uh, are we taken seriously? No, we are not. I think that uh, sometimes our comments have opposite effect because uh, very often the civil servants are taken by populist governments as a sort of a sign of deep state. Yeah. That everything is pre-planned, everything yeah. is against them, uh, which is not true. But um, <clears throat> it's difficult to, to navigate. And... Uh, Another problem is, of course, the social media, where you see that, that some of the diplomats and some of the civil, civil servants really think that they can use this space for their private views. 
but their private views and their private criticism towards their own governments are are taken seriously by by other governments and other civil servants so it's a, it's a very difficult uh, dilemma there and uh, and i i remember from previous panel um somebody said that that this is a good sign that uh, a diplomat can also be uh, a civic activist in a way this is true and i think that our president is a perfect sign of it i think she's acting more like a civic activist than mm. a president sometimes so she comes with a t-shirt to the estonian parliament saying free speech and uh, this is civil activism to my mind on the other hand i think this is a very uh, sort of a tricky issue because uh, if we all do whatever we want and we all say whatever we want uh, it it sort of doesn't make any sense where is this professional ethics where can we draw the line that this is a serious uh, case and this is a uh, less serious so i think um, for uh, for a civil servant who in a way has to implement governmental policy and uh, and has to has to be loyal to the government also has to be loyal to the state and if government doesn't behave sensibly then you have this moral dilemma whether to be loyal to the state or government let's move to specifics though when now Clearly, the, the job of a government spokesperson is sometimes to, to outline what the government's position might be on a given issue. But I assume that in the Estonian foreign ministry, as in other foreign ministries and other public institutions, you also give background briefings to trusted journalists. Is my assumption correct? And how far do you go? Uh, yes, um, giving briefs to journalists is a regular business. We we do that. And how deeply do you go? <clears throat> uh, it depends on the issue. Uh, we, uh, I know that uh, sometimes all information is given out, but the journalists are warned that please do not use this and please do not use this against. And this is uh, quite a new tendency. Right. Um, because uh, we want the journalists to know, but we don't want journalists to make troubles for the government. Yes. So that's A the issue. Very tricky balancing act. <laughs> um, uh, Natalie, I, I want to bring you to the first question that I put um, in, in that rather long list. Of what responsibility does the media bear for the polarization of politics, the rise of nationalism and populism, and most particularly, how might it influence those trends for better or worse in future? Thanks, Bobo, and uh, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a special treat to, to see Pilar, who I, I haven't seen for, for quite a few years, and we were uh, reporters together in, in Moscow in the early 2000s. I remember uh, seeing you on the ground. We, we crossed paths on the ground in the Caucasus uh, near Chechnya. So um, uh, these were very strong experiences. And I know you're still um, coping with many strong experiences in, in Russia. Um, and I, um, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to have this opportunity to ex ex exchange. And I, I look forward also to the questions from the room. Um, with a young generation of, of, of people from across Russia and other countries uh, across our European continent. And um, to go to your question, Bobo, about polarization, um, yes, I do think that the media have a responsibility in, in some of the polarized politics we have. Um, just one thing comes to mind right now when you, we, we ask this question is, I don't know if you remember during uh, Donald Trump's uh, presidential campaign, uh, nobody expected him to be elected president of the United States. And for months, for a long time, nobody expected it, really. He was almost like a clown on the, on the campaign trail. And uh, he did something that was, that was very astute and that many, many journalists did not think about deeply enough. He was 
traveling across the United States and he was regularly calling um, you know, 24-hour television, the cable news channels. He was just calling them from his cell phone and giving instant live interviews. Mm. And because he was good entertainment, he yeah. was good for the, uh, tr the, the audience numbers. He was a good, uh, a good spectacle, a good show, if you like. These uh, cable news channels would allow him to come on, 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 on the screen and with the, his voice uh, live. And he would speak for, you know, as long as he wanted, and he was a good show. And this actually, um, this, this actually was, was done repetitively and probably helped, not the only reason for his election, but probably helped him get elected. And only afterwards did uh, American journalists uh, you know, reflect on what, what happened. How did we let this happen? How did we not think that uh, just to get a bit more audience on our show, uh, we could let him come on any time, whenever he called. And he was proud of this. He, he told people very openly, I can get on any show, any time. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, I think, you know, that's just one example. Um, but I, I've been based in the UK for the last uh, four or five years, and I've seen um, how um, the media scene has contributed to Brexit. Mm. Not the only reason, exactly, of course, um, but it has contributed uh, because there is, a, there is a tabloid press, there is a very strongly anti-European, anti-EU uh, press in the UK, and I've seen the result of this phenomenon, uh, how it has entered people's heads over the years, and it's very something very difficult to correct in just a few weeks of uh, a referendum campaign. Um, but I think there's a deeper thing that I wanted to say, um, and I think, um, again, we journalists have a responsibility, is I, I think that um, when, when people say they don't always trust the media, or they think that the media isn't really close to them, but closer perhaps to people who are in government or in business, or... I think sometimes they, I think they have a point. I'm not saying they always have a point, but I think they do have a point. I think, uh, you know, I'm from the generation that entered journalism in 1989, 1990. Um, and I thought that it was just, you know, fine to report, publish information, cover topics, become an expert in maybe this or that subject, and that at the end, this would spread into society and it would help democracy become a rational debate on rational facts that people believed and trusted that these were true facts. It's become much more complicated than that, we know this. Mm -hmm. We, the, the traditional quote-unquote media, are no longer the gatekeepers. There is an yeah. ocean of content, a notion of uh, sometimes you know, very bad quality journalism, sometimes deliberate disinformation, conspiracy theories. So we, we are not, no longer in that world when I started uh, journalism. Um, and the responsibility we have is that we need to restore uh, trust in our, in our media organi organizations. We, we should no longer assume that people trust us. Yeah. And the, one of the ways we do that, we should be doing that, is we should be much closer to people, much, much closer to people. We have to be on the ground, and I know, uh, you know, Pilar and Sylvie and anybody who's uh, connected to the school and has practiced journalism, I know these are people who are, have been on the ground. I think on the ground journalism, muddy boots journalism, being out there in the, in the families, in the mm -hmm. regions, in the, little, in the little towns, in the villages, this is fundamental. We journalists must get out of our capital cities and go explore our own countries. And we did not do this. I'm saying a we like a collective we of perhaps Western journalists. Mm -hmm. We did not do this enough. And this is how one of the reasons why we had Brexit in the UK. Uh, one of the reasons we had uh, Trump in the US, we have Trump in the US, and one of the reasons I'm French, uh, one of the reasons I believe that you have a phenomenon like the gilets jaunes, the yellow vests in France, which 
hardly any media organizations saw coming. And this became, for seven months, you saw the pictures, this became a, a, a deep wave, a deep social wave. And on later, uh, later next week, you will see there will be more strikes in France and more unrest. This is not entirely unconnected to the fact that the media, like in other countries, have not been listening to people enough. And um, so I, the, the, the question of trust is fundamental. And, it, you know, being on the ground, listening to people, that's the first, that's the obsession that we okay. need to rediscover. And then the technological problems, you know, are another aspect. But I'll, I'll stop there. That raises a couple of questions. I mean, I, I completely understand and, and appreciate the need to get closer to people. But take the BBC. <laughs> yes, they have stories of so-called ordinary people. But when they have a BBC question time, they routinely trot out the same politicians, the same faces. And so they're talking about being closer to people, and yet they'll have Nigel Farage on 33 times in question time. So it's, that's not closer to people. And it just brings me to maybe a wider point. I appreciate that you and Pilar are talking about restoring integrity and trust to journalism. But do, your, do the media proprietors see it that way? Or is their priority not careful, balanced analysis? Their, point, their raison d'etre is box office. It's entertainment. Give the public what they want. It's what sells newspapers. Quality journalism does not sell. We want it to sell. But, and as long as it doesn't sell as much as, say, yellow journalism or tabloid journalism, why will the media proprietors change their approach? Because, I mean, we're talking even a paper, quality paper like Washington Post has dozens of stories on Trump every day. So, I mean, and they're just feeding, it seems to me, they're feeding the Trump phenomenon. They're giving him what he really wants, which is as much airplay as possible. Your, your, all your questions are very difficult, Bobo. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to try on, um, and they're good questions. Um, personally, I don't, on that last aspect of, you know, the Washington Post um, make, publishing many articles about Trump, um, I, don't, I don't think the problem is how many articles are published about mm. Trump. Mm. I think, the, prob the, I think the, 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 the sharper, perhaps, question would be, are are we um, are we uh, making an effort to explain research and explain why some people still support Trump? For example, okay, today, yeah. you know, right. sure. uh, it's one thing yeah. to publish ten articles denouncing Trump, saying this is like a mm -hmm. neo-fascist, you know, mm -hmm. and we we can please ourselves many times doing this, and we have to say it. We have to say it that he's extremely worrying, like other autocrats. Uh, or populists, demagogues, they're extremely worrying. Mm. The, more, the more challenging and perhaps I would say more interesting thing for journalists to do today is to try to understand, again, by going to see people, why many people in the US still support Trump. You know, what is it? What is it? I was recently in Prague and I, I in Prague, as you know, there is a prime minister called uh, Babish, who's a populist. Um, and uh, people have been demonstrating against him. There was a big demonstration in Prague. Uh, there's a, a grassroots movement against him, but he's still there, and he probably won't resign. Why? Because I, as, I, as I heard uh, from people who go to the regions in the Czech Republic, people in the little towns, in the little cities, in the rural areas, they support him. So this is interesting. Why? Why does the urban elite in Prague demonstrate in big numbers against this populist demagogue, why do the people in the region still support him? And there, this is a phenomenon that exists in other countries, um, and this is, this is the, the task that journalists have to, have to take upon themselves. I think it's their responsibility. If yeah. you cast light on these reasons, then you help people find solutions to this populism or this demagoguery. Right. Oh, that's terrific. Kadri, I wanted to, I mean, uh, uh, 
you'll have a number of points that you'll be making, but I wanted to know whether you would consider answering this idea of a post-truth world, competing narratives and uh, allegations and the realities of foreign disinformation and where it all sits in, in that sort of intersection between media and politics. Um, yeah, happily. These were actually the points I was <laughs> planning to address. Uh, but, but, Fitz, uh, but yes, from my behalf, thank you for inviting me um, again and again. <laughs> I would though maybe start with um, a more general remark. When you, Bobo, sent your questions, um, you know, many of them focus on Western media, and I realized that I don't know what that is. Mm. Uh, because the few countries whose media landscape I think I know, they are all different. And, uh, and each country has different media outlets with their own culture. So we, we shouldn't say that media does want that or do that. I mean, myself, I have worked for a newspaper where the publisher, the editor, the journalists, and the owner of the newspaper all had different visions for that paper and wanted it to do different things. And the reality actually emerged as a result of day-to-day -day fight, mm -hmm. uh, which was which, a which sort of philosophical line to go at. So I would, I would be careful about generalizations. And I think you know, what is possible in British press would not be possible in, in German or... Um, or Estonian, or mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one thing. And second thing, of course, is that it is natural that we are facing all these questions because the change we are going through is fairly fundamental. Uh, social media, the whole technological change, um, it is bound to disrupt uh, these landscapes. So we shouldn't be lamenting about it as if it's mm -hmm. something unnatural mm -hmm. that has befallen us. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we should be careful, of course, because mm -hmm. these disruptive changes can lead to something that we do not want to see. Uh, but yes, uh, on to truth, whether there is truth or is it post-truth, I think there is truth and, and there is demand for truth. And I think that is quite natural. I mean, you can entertain yourself by reading your yeah, Daily Mail or whatnot. But at one point, I think very many people feel the need for sort of proper, reliable, fact-checked journalism. Okay. It's like, you know, after eating eight ice creams, you feel like herring and potatoes. Um, <clears throat> OK. <laughs> so... <laughs> Brussels sprouts, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, you want some healthy diet also in the sphere of media. Sure. So I'm, I'm not yeah. really worried about that. And I, I think we see it happening already. I mean, Financial Times, I think, is making profit and, and they do check facts. They, they have sober editorial line. It, it can work, yes. <laughs> Uh, my worry here is rather, um, you know, can you make, is that business model viable in, in all countries? Okay. I mean, English-speaking media audience is big enough to sustain financial times and maybe mm -hmm. several. Mm. That, is, that is totally fine. But yeah. say, is Estonian audience big enough to sustain an Estonian financial times? Yeah. Is there enough advertising? Is there enough, are there enough paying people? What would be the right price to ask for biggest Estonian daily as mm. from subscribers? Yeah. These are the dilemmas. So yeah. I, what I see is that we might have a um, fragmented media landscape in the sense that there will be some people who consume quality media and, and other layers of society that will always consume crap media. Uh, and that will actually translate into political problems. Mm -hmm. Yet again, that would be nothing new. I think, you know, there was a time when um, books were written in Latins and kept in monasteries, and that was fairly limited. Limited number of people who got access, and the others lived on gossip. Um, so we could have a more modern version of, of that landscape. That is also manageable, but, 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 but totally different from what we have become considered normal. So how do you, 
how to deal with this business model. I think in democratic countries, smaller ones, public broadcasting could actually play a very good role. If if country's democratic culture is strong enough to have proper safeguards to keep independent content, I think that can work in, in, in a number of countries very well. But maybe not all. So that is my question to which I, I don't have a proper answer, but I think, yeah, business model matters. How should media behave in polarized landscapes? Mm, you know, if I have learned anything from my time in Russia, um, I have learned that media shouldn't become a crusader. Regardless how of how much you might uh, be fond of certain values, you shouldn't tweak the truth in order to defend them. I don't think right. that, that Russian journalists' decision to depart from impartiality in order to help Boris Yeltsin in 1996 okay. was a good decision. Okay. They never really got back to proper uh, objective reporting of, after that collectively. And likewise, I am a bit worried about liberal media in the United States these days. Right. I think my instinct in that situation would be and that's a learned instinct. That has not what I was born mm -hmm. with. I was born mm -hmm. a crusader, and, <laughs> and now I have changed my mind. <laughs> um, I, I would be a lot more cautious, very strict about reporting. And, and report, present people fairly. Don't, you know, don't make use of them. Every now and then, each journalist knows it. A politician drops a slip of a tongue that is so juicy. If you report it, it becomes a big event. And, you know, it might be a politician you dislike. You'd love it to happen. But if it doesn't really represent what he was having in mind in that interview, mm -hmm. should you actually do it? Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should give him a fair treatment and, 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 and his opponents a fair treatment. And, and by that sort of position yourselves in a society as, well, not a fair arbiter exactly, but at least someone who is fair and, and can be trusted. That, that would be my advice for, uh, for, for those sorts of, uh, of, of, of situations. And actually that can be done in many media models. You also had a question about free media and controlled media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would still distinct very much. I mean, media in, in yeah. free societies is one thing. Media in non-free societies is another thing. But that doesn't mean that in non-free society you cannot actually do quality media. I mean, I would say that Literaturnaya Gazeta in late 1980s was a lot better, for, more thoughtful, more objective than, say, Daily Mail three yeah, days in, sure. in, in the free yeah, yeah, United yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. So these things can also be um, done. And foreign interference, yeah. I remain a skeptic. I okay. mean, if we, right. if we speak fine. about Russian in the influence, Russians now, I don't think it can be meaningful. A few trolls do not do the trick. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I just don't believe in it. But yet again, I think you one ought to be a lot more strict about one's own media what i see for instance in the uk it is exactly that the tabloid press is actually preparing ground for russia today or well, rt is now by by eroding the concept of truth yeah. but it can exist at all yeah. and that's not discussed at all no. i think you know that is much more yeah. dangerous yeah. and yeah. and and can act in symbiosis with ill-wishing actors yeah. And, and here, you know, if, if in terms of business model, business models, the small societies are disadvantaged, then actually I think in terms of foreign influence, small societies have an advantage of, of people knowing people. Everything can actually be fact-checked very easily. Mm -hmm. You pick up phone, you call, you, you know. And that is, I think, why uh, the fake news has, has not done great in places like, say, uh, Baltic states or, or Finland. I mean, people manage, People mention that Finland is educating people about media. Yeah, that's that's a good thing to do as well. Mm. But actually, I think smallness of society and trust inside society yes. yeah. that that plays a role, and that that helps to very quickly find out what is happening if if some strange news story um, pops up. Yeah, I think. Okay, great. Well, I have a couple of uh, questions that. 
arise from what you've just said. You spoke about varied reading habits, a varied media. Are you talking about for society in general, or are you talking about, in a sense, individuals? Because there is an argument to say that different people read different newspapers. So there are like media tribes. And media tribes translate into political tribes. So you have this, this uh, dichotomy, this division between the so-called educated classes on the one hand, the people who want to remain, want Britain to remain in the European Union, and then you have the ordinary, sort of the earth people who, who read other papers, and, and there is this natural division. So I just wonder whether, you know, the person who's eating chips is going to continue eating chips. The person who e eats ice cream is going to continue eating ice cream. They're not going to have their broccoli or Brussels sprouts or salads or whatever. They just will never go there. So that, in a sense, that m those media divisions, those media tribes are actually contributing to the polarisation of society, a po polarisation of society and polarisation of politics. The second question for you is this. You are critical of advocacy in media outlets, and you refer to uh, the United States in particular there. But what about, for example, The Guardian's ongoing campaign to combat climate change? Is that good advocacy, bad advocacy, or should The Guardian just have a a balanced coverage. It shouldn't, it shouldn't go so hard in campaigning, having so many columns supporting efforts to combat climate change. In other words, it should be more like the BBC. Um, no, I don't, I don't think anyone should be like BBC. <laughs> Why is that? I, um, no, I, um, Too anodyne? Not prepared to commit? Too superficial. Yeah. I mean, my, my experience with BBC has been that they are interested in sound bites, not, not actual knowledge and debate. I mean, I, uh, I had been in England, I think, for a year when I decided that BBC is not worth my time. I stopped going to their morning shows because mm. why would I get up at 5 a.m. for <laughs> two questions, one of which is definitely irrelevant. Yeah. I just yeah. don't want to do yeah. that. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Estonian yeah. media is... is is much less eloquent and, mm -hmm. and much less sophisticated and, uh, and often less well informed, but for God's sake, they are serious. So I, I any time, rather, rather, rather speak with them, and I think it's, it's, it's much better. Mm -hmm. Now, the questions you ask are, are, are tricky, but yet again, I don't think they are universal. I, I, can, mm -hmm. I can see media tribes at work in the UK, yep. and and, and to me, that is actually quite shocking how false coverage of, of certain media groups really have brought along Brexit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd think that, that this is fairly innocent entertainment until one day it, it is not. Mm. But yet again, it's not the same in, in, in other countries. I mean, in Estonia, you could probably also find different media tribes, but I would bet that many of them still sit down at nine, at nine o'clock public broadcasting news. Yeah. So there is also some, 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 some common ground, and I think that is, that is the case in many other societies as well. What to do in a place like Britain, I, 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 do, not, I do not know. I rest Robert Murdoch. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. but, um, and Guardian question, I think, Keep comments and 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 uh, and news separate. Okay. That's always a That's, good policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, make sure news are fact checked. Yeah. Uh, make sure opinion doesn't doesn't use wrong facts either. I mean, to the extent you can. Sometimes, sometimes you don't have good enough editors who would know what, what actually are facts or or um, or you know. Some sometimes sometimes you end up turning down really innovative stuff because editor has never seen it. But, you know, that's that's a different question already. Like, it's like okay. Einstein's first paper was turned down because it, it was just too strange. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are, there, are, there are some dangers always, okay. but, but there are certain good principles one could try to stick to. Okay, great. Um, Sylvie, so far we've been, you know, you're all journalists who mainly have operated in 
or come from the West, Western countries, or op operated in Western democracies. And, um, we have mainly been talking about the experience of journalism in these democracies, but I was just wondering what you thought, what sort of role journalists could play in so-called the liberal democracies and indeed in openly authoritarian regimes? Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm very happy to sit on this totally unbalanced panel because not only <laughs> is it only women, but there are two French and two Estonians, yeah. but I'm very happy with this. It's a great panel, so thank do? you very much. <laughs> um, to answer your question, um, you know, at the beginning when I started to come to the uh, Moscow school when it was in Russia, um, I remember feeling uncomfortable or, or guilty about having to talk about uh, what is it like working for free media in a free country mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to you know, people who either were journalists or were not, but were operating in a very, very controlled media environment and political environment. And I was thinking, you know, what kind of advice can I give? Because the way I operate is very, dif is very different. And, and um, so, uh, you know, I was thinking maybe the audience is uh, l listening with envy at something, you know, they, 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 which is out of reach for them. And then we went into this uh, present environment where we have so many challenges and, you know, those that which you have described and, you know, business models breaking down and uh, post-truth um, uh, world and, you know, all these challenges and lack of trust that Natalie talked about, which is absolutely true. And uh, so now... I feel less guilty or uncomfortable, but on the other hand, I don't want to demoralize you, <laughs> okay. you know, because I, as Pilar said, I think journalism is still very, very useful, like shoes, and um, <laughs> we all need them, and, and it's proving its uh, usefulness every day in all our countries, liberal or yeah. democratic or not democratic, liberal or illiberal, so... Um, how can these? How can journalists operate in an uh, authoritarian or illiberal environment? I think, just like us, but except that it's more difficult. But there's a new. Uh, we can see a lot of successes, and I think this is uh, very encouraging, and it confirms the need for uh, for journalism. Um, for instance, um, Slovakia. Right, um, you had this journalist Jan Kuczak who was murdered uh, 18 months ago, and that murder of himself and his uh, um, fiance or girlfriend or wife, I, partner, I don't remember exactly, but th those two murders um, outraged people so much that they, you know it, they took to the streets. Uh, it had very, very deep, uh, important political consequences. The prime minister had to resign. Then um, uh, later this uh, president, Zuzana uh, Chaputova, was elected, who is a, a lawyer and who is uh, uh, acting very, very uh, with the tools she has uh, vigorously about um, corruption and the rule of law. So that that was first uh, uh, an important development, but also uh, journalists of Slovakia, but also of other countries, took up the investigations that Nyat Kuczak was working on. Mm -hmm. There's now a network called Forbidden Stories mm -hmm. uh, that my paper is part of, and The Guardian is also, and it's about... Uh, I think 15 or, or, or 15 to 20 newspapers working on those, or, or media organizations, because there are also radios and, and TV mm -hmm. channels, um, you know, putting, joining efforts to work on those investigations that journalists who have been either killed or threatened or suspended or, you know, who are not able to carry out their work anymore. Um, so these investigations are taken by other journalists, including foreign journalists, and 
they are brought about. You know, they, brought they bring results. For instance, in, in Slovakia, the, the mafia leader who took the order, who ordered that, those murders, uh, so not only the people who carried out the murders were arrested, uh, you know, they are just um, an ex-policeman who was yeah. paid 20,000 euros for that. But the guy who ordered um, the, the murders is in jail now. Yeah. So that's, I think, something which yeah, is extremely positive. Yeah. Uh, positive. Yeah. Yeah. We also have this case about Malta. So Malta is a European Union uh, member state. You, it cannot be exactly described as an authoritarian regime, but it is... Uh, a, a country which has a lot of problems with the rule of law and with corruption. And um, so this journalist, Daphne uh, Caruana, was um, murdered three years ago when a, a bomb was put on her car and she was again investigating very difficult uh, cases. So um, one of uh, that, that came about just after the Panama Papers, and one she had exposed somebody who had been. She was invest. She was working on investigation on a Maltese um, politician who had been exposed in the Panama Papers, and so again, other journalists has taken this uh, investigation, and now we can see very recently that there has been a string of resignations in the Maltese government, the, the, the tourism mm -hmm. minister, yeah. um, the economy minister, I think, you know. Uh, so, again, we can see the results. So, this is something which uh, I think is very, uh, it's a very positive development that Th those uh, coordinations or groupings or networks of journalists, there's also, of course, a much more powerful organization called the ICIJ, International uh, Consortium of uh, Investigative Journalists, yeah, which is based in Washington, D.C. So this is a bigger effort. It has like 220 journalists from 80 countries, mm. and this mm. is the organization which has produced the Panama Papers, the yeah. Lux Leaks, yeah. the Swiss Leaks, you know, uh, several um, very interesting operations which exposed uh, fiscal uh, evasion, uh, mm. um, you know, a lot of, of okay. very uh, of misdeeds which were done by either by individu powerful individuals or government. So I think this, you know, you also probably heard all of you about Bellingcat. Yep. Uh, there's also a, a, a network in the Balkans. You know, I think this is fairly recent developments and, and they are very good and they can help journalists who work in very difficult environment unlike us. Okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. In the case of Slovakia and again in the case of Malta, there were specific murders around, uh, in other words, there was, a spe there was specific focus around which people could uh, train their attention on. I can see that the, the kind of networks that you're, you're describing would be very useful in, if you like, sustaining the investigation, providing, in a sense, a, a long-term deterrent, perhaps. But what do you do, what does a journalist do about system-wide abuses? So, for example, take, take uh, the control of the media in Hungary. Mm -hmm. So, Slovakia, Babic is in trouble. Sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. no, Czech Republic. But in Hungary, Orban has benefited from the kind of media coverage. So, uh, what can journalists do in a country like Hungary rather than in mm -hmm. um, Slovakia or Malta, where there isn't a specific yeah. focus of attention? Mm -hmm. um, so, in Hungary, I'll take two examples, Poland and Hungary, right? Okay. Um, in Hungary, it's more difficult because it's, um, the civil society has been less reactive or less strong, maybe less well-trained right. than the Polish civil society. Yeah. And so, um, a lot of media have been bought or, you know, it's true that Orban has managed to take control yeah. of a lot of including private media, because public media, of mm. course, it's easy. Private media is more difficult, but it, he has managed to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, some of them still, there are still a few 
independent layout layouts yeah um, and you know Hungarian you also have web websites um, but it's true that the space is is diminishing and that's so that's, what can they do or what can out Western journalists I or think, networks yeah, they can, how, how can, can they help there have been actually there have been um, quite very good investigations about Orban's um, private okay. fortune, uh, mm. you know, about the corruption about in, in, in his family or in his, uh, among his, uh, in his entourage. And this has been done either by, together by Hungarian journalists and, and other European journalists. I forgot exactly which yeah. was the, but it has been done. Yep. Yeah, because okay. uh, some, some of it has been even given an award by the European Press Prize. So, okay. so it, it, but of, of obviously it's more difficult, you know. Clear. Now, yeah. Poland, um, uh, again, the public media, public TV is totally controlled to a point that, you know, <laughs> it was really unimaginable. Um, mm. I would say 15 years ago, um, but uh, there are still strong independent media. You have Gazeta Wyborcza, this newspaper, yeah. which is yeah. uh, so. <laughs> we go back to this debate about whether it should be a crusader. Gazeta, mm -hmm. the Gazeta mm -hmm. Wyborcza has become, you know, started as a very political, as a crusader because it's yeah, yeah. you know electoral yeah. newspaper. It was created for the 1989 uh, election to 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 support the Solidarność candidates. And then it became a very good professional newspaper, yeah. you know. And then since 2015, uh, since peace came to power, Law and Justice Party, um, it has become a crusader again because um, it's, a, it's a big political fight and they choose that, that path. Okay. Uh, but they are doing it quite, I think, quite quite effectively. And there's also a, an independent TV uh, TV channel, which also is is quite effective. So so you still have pl yeah. pluralism, and you can still work, though it's more difficult. But you still right. have uh, access to independent news. I would say in Poland. Well, that's very that's very interesting. Look. Um I think we still have about an hour. Is that correct? Because we started late. Um, so I'm going. This is quite a controversial set of topics. I'm going to take questions and interventions in threes. Start with you, Kostya, then Ina, and then I'll go to John. Um, yes. Uh, do have a mic? <laughs> Thanks, Madam Ina. Uh, yes, my name is Konstantin Agat, and. Um, Frankly, um, I'd like to be a bit controversial and provocative That's what uh, because it all sounded very <laughs> sedentary and nice and uh, uh, we're like among people like ourselves. So, <laughs> uh, um, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Kadri for, uh, for her um, intervention and uh, as a professional journalist, I, I Totally agree with you. I think times have changed. We have to move on. And yes, we have to agree that a lot of people will be consuming a lot of diff different media sources from now on. By the way, they always did. It's just that there were much fewer. So we have to live with that and we'll have to live with the fact that sometimes they will elect people that we, people who eat organic vegetarian pizzas, <laughs> and drink lattes, uh, we actually do not like. That's true. It's called democracy. And it's probably going to be a new face of democracy, but that's the way uh, it will be from now on with the proliferation of social media, unless we want to ban Facebook and Twitter and, and whatever else is going to appear very soon. That's number one, it's called, I think. Yeah. Uh, a development which can't be reversed. It's like invention of a wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, of course, for the reaction to that, uh, what you said and what Rina said proves to me again that for any kind of um, uh, sober media analysis, you have to go east of the Oder River, with an honorable exception of the Financial Times. Um, everything west seems a bit muddled to me, and I think, alas, the 
the example of that is uh, what uh, Natalie said. I think, Natalie, I'm really sorry. Everything you said and what your paper did uh, is exactly uh, the cause why journalism, mainstream journalism, is in such a big trouble. Because if you think that the response to Donald Trump and Brexit, both I don't like, is uh, to muddy the boots, then go and speak to Little England. But you may not find things that you find there very attractive. You will find people who like the crown, that basically enter immigration, and so on and so forth. These are not the values that your paper espouses. So how to deal with that? I think uh, going and muddying your boots for nothing is not, not an answer. And if you think that answering to that is putting uh, a hardline communist as Shakar instead of a hardline Stalinist, Seamus Mill, on your column sort of page, on your op-ed page, is an answer to this little England. I think you're wrong again. You're going to get more Boris Johnsons and more Brexits in the future. And the same goes, of course, for Donald Trump. Why they are writing about Donald Trump in the Washington Post? Because he's a bloody president of the United States, yeah. the most important politician in the world. We might not like him, but that's what they do. I think that we need to really calm down as professional journalists. And I think that what uh, uh, what uh, Kadri said is extremely important, uh, is that in the age of social media, someone has to carry the torch for normal things we know, separation of opinion from fact, news reporting from opinion, and so on and so forth. There is no other way. I mean, it may be completely we may be defeated as journalists, but it's completely existential that we have to continue doing that, because no one else will do. There will be a lot of people doing the Daily Mail or the Daily Socialist Worker or whatever online in different guises. So what, someone has to do that. Someone has to carry the torch. And I think that that's the only way for, for people who call themselves journalists to, to, to exist. Just quickly on Trump, I, I suppose the, the point I'm asking really is there's so much focus on Trump the person, the foibles of Trump, rather than the Trump presidency's policies on X, Y and Z. That's that. It's the over-personalization of the U.S. presidency and of U.S. policy. Not that the presidency is being covered. Yeah, well, look, we remember the same thing uh, happening in 2000, 2008 with, well, to a lesser extent, of course, with uh, George W. Bush. Exactly. So it's not the first time that we see it. I agree. Uh, I agree. But yeah. uh, I do think that um, probably what, what, where I take your point is that they have 12 uh, articles uh, in the Wash Post or in the New York Times saying that Trump eats children for breakfast and uh, retirees for dinner, exactly. then that exactly works for Trump. Here I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Because no one will believe this exaggerated uh, monster uh, image. And I think when you sober down, mm -hmm. then the, um, the, the, the real deficiencies of this person, which are very serious, will stand out mm. instead of this uh, constant white noise which people stop registering at a certain point in time. Very fair point. Ina. Yeah, um, thank you, everyone. It's actually a dream come true to see you all together. Um, and it's, it was very interesting. Um, probably um, I'll dare to repeat what's been said partly uh, by Konstantin also, but I just can't help saying it. But the remark, Natalie, you made, why Donald Trump was elected. I lived in the US 10 years ago, and there was this um, extremely funny and extremely intellectual John Stewart's Daily Show. So there was one video that uh, it was so funny, you could laugh your head off unless you understand that people they, that were focus of that video were rednecks, and they were laughed at in a very bad manner. So when years later Donald Trump was elected and I saw our friends in the US uh, having heart attacks and being depressed, I was not surprised at all. Because what I saw back then, if you go a little down south from Washington, you see all those peoples, people called rednecks. And of course you see lack of education, you see ignorance, you see um, afflictive emotions, you see anger there. But what's behind it all is still, I'm afraid, and we have to see to uh, claim for dignity. 
And there is also ignorance on both shores uh, among elites and university experts, professors, that do not want to see that claim of dignity there. So mm. what Donald Trump did, he just used it. Okay. And I'm not going to comment on Donald Trump. I believe everyone here would <laughs> share more or less the same opinion on that person. So my question is whether, especially on the media, we have to um, extend this idea of the right to dignity to everyone, because it's a universal right. Mm. And uh, even to those who share different values, okay. even to those who have different backgrounds. Um, so that's my question. That's an excellent question. John. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Bobo. Um, uh, two or three points. First, um, uh, on the question of truth, uh, I'm much, much older than Pilar. Um, uh, and so I'm even more reactionary and traditional <laughs> than she is about the truth. I think that what journalism is about, or should be about, is about the truth. Mm -hmm. But one has to qualify that, I think, that the truth in journalism, in newspapers and in broadcasts, and God knows on the internet and social media, adheres to a certain line. And you quickly learn that when you join a newspaper. Uh, when I was at university, I got a job as taking copy for the Scottish Daily Mail. And you sit in a cubicle with earphones on and uh, reporters phone you up because it's the only way of getting their story into the paper if they're not around. And they dictate their story. And after six o'clock, they were all drunk. And so you had to, in a sense, make it up <laughs> between the gaps in their, in their narrative. And being the Scottish Daily Mail, it was centre-right, I suppose. It was pro-conservative. And the stories were, although very often quite a lot of it was true, it tended to edge towards the right. It would, it would put up the things which benefited the right and keep down the things that... It was there, mm. you know, the comments were there and the... Facts were there, but they were, you know, the, the, the journalists themselves knew very well uh, how to so fix the story that it, it adhered to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the line. Another instance, actually one relevant to where we are now, and people have been talking this morning about the fall of the wall. I had the good luck to be in East Berlin when the wall fell. I went to the famous press conference by Gunther Schabowski and milled around afterwards whatever he was saying. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? And what he said was, as I think was said this morning, that uh, since he didn't have anything written on his sheet, said, well, okay, so whatever. Uh, the, um, the wall is, the, the frontier is open. And going down Unter and Linden later that day, that evening, you could see the people beginning to come over the wall, mm. the people on the East German side still being frightened, the guards were there. And on one side, there was a highly lit TV platform. And on it was Tom Brokaw of, I think, NBC. The only, I think, the only broadcast journalist to get in. He'd been in before doing interviews and just happened to be there when the wall fell. So they put the lights on and he was there and I passed it. and. Uh, intern came up to me and said, uh, and said, do you speak English? So I said, <laughs> wishing to be, you know, make a little joke of it, I said, well, I'm Scottish, but I'll, you know, I'll have a try. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think he thought Scottish was a, re a region of Germany. So he, <laughs> he, he said, okay, okay, we'll put you on next. Now, what we think is, and I'm paraphrasing, but what we think is that this is a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous opening for freedom and democracy. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I better tell you, I'm not German. I'm Scottish, which means I'm British, and you better get somebody else. But uh, you realize then the power already, the story was being, the line was already being written. Yeah. Now, I happen to agree with the guy, yeah. but the line was there. And what I, what I had I gone on, and I felt... Afterwards, I should have gone on with a sort of thick accent. That, that here was 
you know, that, that if I'd said, well, no, I actually, I think it was a bad idea. I'm, I'm not, not sure that these Germans wouldn't be happier being held here for another few decades just to learn how lucky they are. Uh, uh, it wouldn't have gone down well. Okay. It might have been you know, put on as a kind of a curious thing, but, but it wouldn't have gone down well. I wanted just to pick up uh, Natalie on Brexit. I think Brexit was actually a popular movement. And that was the most important thing, that people for quite a long time, but especially people who are on a, <coughs> excuse me, on a low income or in the in north and midlands of, of England, actually didn't and don't like the European Union. And they didn't need the sun to tell them that. Mm. And actually, when you count up the number of papers which are, are pro were uh, for Remain, you have all the posh papers, I think, apart from the Telegraph, the posh papers being uh, The Guardian, The Times, uh, the FT, of course, The Independent, you have The Daily Mirror. Mm -hmm. The Daily Mail actually went after one editor, Baker, left over to a kind of yeah. modified, you know, this way and that way. <laughs> it was never, but actually rather yeah. pro-Remain, if anything, if anything for a while. So, and the BBC, often straining at the seams because it was the people there were clearly uh, pro-Remain, uh, has done, I think, a kind of creditable job of, of remaining, remaining uh, uh, neutral. So I, the main thing about, I think, and the polls show this, the polls taken after, why did you vote Brexit? We voted Brexit to take back control. And you could make fun of that, say, what do you mean by control? But... Actually, it's, you could also say it's a kind of a democratic thing. I voted Remain. I think it's a bad idea to leave. But actually, the, the, the impulse to take back control, to have a parliament which you can uh, understand because you understand the people there. You may hate them, but you understand who they are because they are, as it were, flesh of your flesh and mm. bone of your bone. Uh, and you have some control over them. You vote for them. You can vote for them. For the European Union, you can't. Finally, uh, and Kadri made this point, and I, th I think Sylvie did as well, Sylvie especially made this point, that we've got more truth around and more fact-checking. Indeed, fact-checking began only about 10, 15 years ago as independent institutions, and now there are maybe 50 or 60 of them around, mostly in West Europe, North America, fact-checkers uh, who check facts uh, and publish the mistakes they find. We've got more investigative journalism around than we've ever had. I went to a, did a conference in Romania a couple of weeks ago with Romanian journalists. Mm -hmm. Romania, two Romanian journalists made sure that the corrupt leader of the Social Democratic Party is now in jail. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, the judge had to find him guilty, the judge was honest, but it was investigative journalism which did it. And investigative journalism now does enormous amounts of, of revelations, like yeah, has been yeah. said. So, so we, we live in a, a, a state which, of course, has got huge amounts of rubbish and lies and so on. We always did. But we also live in a state or in a world in which there are huge amounts of material on the web and elsewhere, which are valuable, which are truthful, which, which try their best to be truthful, which check. Uh, and, and publish. So we're, we're, in some ways, we journalists, not so much newspaper journalists, apart from the Financial Times, a, uh, but, may, but many newspaper journalists have never had it so bad because they're being fired. But journalism is probably in a better state mm. than it has been for a long time. Interesting. Um, before I go to Pilar, I just uh, have a quick question for you. Um, you talk about take... Uh, the take back control message was a was a seductive one, but I always wondered what well, take back control against whom is it take back control against the EU or was it take back control against those posh urban effete intellectual elites in London? Yeah, no, I don't think it was either, Bob. I think it was actually taking back control of our of of the, the major a major mechanism of democracy. Okay. Voting for something comprehensible. And right. I, I, I mean, as you, you know as well as I do, and most people in this room know, you have to have, 
you have to have quite a strong grasp of how the U European Union works and Europe mm, mm, to actually know how the decisions are made how, and how they come through and how they get into national legislatures. Okay. I mean, I voted Remain in part because I knew that no British government would go along the road of creating a, a European state or a federal mm, state sure. of Europe. It would remain semi-detached. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Peter, yeah. you're... I forget it. Uh, well, I got inspired by Constantine and John, <laughs> and I just want to to say several things just to find out whether I understood I understood uh, you, uh, you correctly. Well, we are not perfect. Humanity is not perfect. Number one. Number two. We uh, 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 journalism is no science. Number two. Yeah. Number three. There is a thing called uh, the rudiments and the basics of journalism, in which there is what Kadri has said: facts should be separated from opinions. Yeah, classic. Yeah. Number four, um, stereotypes. We work on stereotypes, and we have to make our daily gymnastics to get rid of those stereotypes. And those stereotypes do not only apply to the reality we look at, but we also apply to the media. The stereotypes said that the uh, media XXX, I don't want to mention anybody, uh, uh, is very good and gets everything and it has a good reputation. So everybody in the world, especially in small papers, have to report on that line. We all, when we were young, have been said, the agency so and so and so has said that. And if you were right, nobody was going to believe you because you work for a little media in a little shitty place, and uh, nobody was going to believe it. And I suffer very, that for, very much from that. Mm -hmm. So I don't respect anyone. The, me the media have to win their breath every day. And as far as uh, uh, facts and uh, uh, Kadri has said everything, very, um, very um, how do you say, daring thing, she has criti criticized the BBC, and why not? Yeah, because uh, the fact that you make uh, 10 interviews of real people and you describe the, the color of the, of the shit they are we wearing or, or the shoes they are wearing or whether they have curly, curly hair or, or whatever, doesn't mean anything. You have to make 100 interviews to realize what comes from reality and to grasp that and to let that to another level. And that's a creative job. And I am also for the creative uh, uh, side of journalism. And that will be everything, I think. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that my defense will be of journalists as, um, as an individual, no matter where he or she works. Because uh, there is so much suffering in this community because someone has said something. And they have so much audience that this something has to be transformed in your something, even if you don't see anywhere that I think you have to apply for pluralism, democracy, and uh, listen to all people everywhere. That's it. Great. Uh, Natalie, do you wanted to come in at this moment? Thanks. Um, um, a side thought on, on the BBC. I mean, I think there are quite a few countries in the world that would be uh, where people would dream of having uh, the quality of information that you can see on the BBC. I mean, you know, we're, we are talking about... Uh, a, a major news organization with incredible resources. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but you know, I can name quite a few countries that that would um, where people would benefit from having that quality um, information. But I see, I see what you mean about sound bites. I think that's a problem shared by many televisions. Just on that point, do you think the BBC currently punches? beneath its weight, below its weight, you know given what? the resources that it does you have. You know what? I'm going to answer, I'm going to move the, if I can, sure. the, move the conversation away from the BBC and the UK and Brexit, sure. actually, yeah. because this, the fact that we've been spending so much time on this illustrates something which, I've, I've, mm -hmm. uh, which strikes me increasingly, is that in our, everybody here is from the wider European continent, okay? Uh, our, you know, our information space, what we discuss, the way we inform ourselves about events, is highly dominated by the Anglo-American media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I work for one Anglo-UK-based uh, uh, media organization. 
And this, I think, is something we need to reflect on um, as citizens across our diverse, complex European space and also as journalists. It's incredible that with every nationality that's in this room, we're spending so much time on Brexit, on the BBC. I know that's because, you know, on this stage, there's several people who've been, you know, spending a lot of time in the UK, uh, and that's, that's natural. But let's, can we try to widen the scope sure. and uh, look at the state of journalism across Europe? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, there are investigative outlets, but I think they're struggling. Um, yes, there are many new things okay. happening, but I think the scene across Europe is actually quite worrying. Um, okay. And this, this year, I checked on this earlier this year, the, the, the Council of Europe has a media watchdog, and the media watchdog this year said that freedom of the press in Europe, the, so it's the Council of Europe, meaning it's wider than the EU, uh, freedom of the press in Europe it has never been uh, in as much danger and under as much threat since the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, and, and then listed uh, the number of countries where uh, media organizations are under pressure. And it's not, just, it's not just Hungary, you know, just not long ago when Salvini was in, the, in government in, in Italy, the first thing he did was put somebody from his party heading the public uh, yeah. broadcaster, yeah. national yeah. television. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, national broadcasters are not only, uh, you know, put under a certain degree of, of um, politicization, let's say, in... in, uh, in uh, in so-called, you know, already illiberal, illiberal countries. So do you take a different view then to, to John's, the, uh, John Lloyd's, which is that journalists may be in trouble, but basically journalism is, is kind of thriving? I, I, I think journalists, I think the basics of journalism um, are, you know, will, will remain the same. And, and to, to Kostya's point, uh, I'm not I, 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 you know, you're very passionate, but I'm not sure I understood what you said or you, whether you understood what I said. What I was saying was that um, the way we, the way we, as institutions in a democracy, I was talking about media organizations in a democracy, mm -hmm. the way we play our role in a democracy is is by going to also by going to listen to people by exploring the realities that are outside our newsrooms outside our capital cities mm -hmm. and that's also how you give citizens the sense that their dignity is being respected exactly. that the media yeah. organizations yeah. are listening yeah. to them and i believe in the uk in in france to a certain degree and in the us this this hasn't always happened as it should have. If okay. you do that, if you go and listen to people, ask them, you know, what's wrong, what's troubling you, you actually, you're showing respect, actually, you're listening yes. to them, oh, then okay. you can relay those, those comments and problems to the higher political level and perhaps, you know, play your role in, in society. Of course, in autocratic regimes, this does not happen, right? In autocratic regimes, citizens are served you know, uh, news entertainment, which is, you know, the propaganda machine, it just spills it out every evening on television. I'm talking about, you know, free countries with it, where there's a free press. I think the press sure. has not entirely fulfilled its role. That's what I'm worried about. Okay, great. Kadri. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, two things I wanted to address. Uh, one was Kostya's remark that every now and then a different media tribe can elect a president. Uh, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm entirely fine with that. I mean, that is indeed something that needs to happen every now and, and then. Uh, but what troubles me is when that happens on, based of, on the basis of information that is, that is false. And the same, you know, about Brexit. If, if, if people who voted for Brexit simply want to go away or they... Are they, they just want to life to slow down, calm down a little bit? They have my full understanding and sympathy. That's fine. If that's your, yeah. But my problem is with the people who voted for Brexit, hoping that then Britain will be better off and their own life will be better. That is definitely not the case for Sunderland. I mean, maybe, I don't know, London City might benefit from Brexit in, in certain circumstances, but Sunderland will, will not. And, and you know, maybe, maybe that's a necessary learning process as well, that people see that they have been lied to and they, they draw a lesson for that. But that is learning it very hard way. And 
And the trust that gets broken down in the course of such things uh, is, is very hard to restore. I mean, think George W. Bush and Tony Blair are long out of power. We don't really think or speak about, about Iraq anymore. But actually, the false information about the Iraqi mm, weapons yeah, of mass destruction, yeah. that still lingers in the sense, I think lots of trust has been broken because of that. And that yeah. is still there. Yeah. So yeah. that is where my, my trouble lies. Mm. And, and about, yeah, I think, John, you put uh, your finger on something important as well, but the line has been set. And that, that really happens every now and then. I remember how, um, and, and in real circumstances also, for the media, it's possible to behave this way or that way. When Estonia joined the EU in 2004, I gave interviews to several Western journalists. And, and one stuck to the line that now, you know, you are becoming European and job <laughs> markets and, and so forth. And then there was another film crew who were sincerely interested. What is life in Estonia like? How it will change now? They, they did for a work. And most amazing was that actually both of these crews were from BBC. <laughs> <laughs> so really inside the same organization you can have totally different course, approaches course, but that is something i would i would wish journalists were more self-critical about the stories where a line has been set i mean at least do double check if a line is still correct yeah. I, I i i i almost sinned against it myself uh, I, I went to Kaliningrad in 2001 to do the story of Kaliningrad as, as capital of HIV AIDS in Russia, because that's what it was known for. Everyone was doing that story. Wow. So I, I, I went too. And in the hospital, actually, doctors rolled their eyes and said, that, listen, young lady, that's long not true. We, we were the first region to get AIDS, but we were also the first one to get countermeasures. Scandinavians financed all needle exchanges and, and so forth, so now actually we are doing quite well. I was so ashamed. <laughs> well, at least you found the truth. Yeah, so, yes. so, um, Sylvie, you wanted to come in here. Yes, quickly. Uh, because what Ina said, and Natalie, and in fact uh, you, uh, Kostya, is I think you agree. Um, when Natalie says we should go more to meet real people and we didn't do this enough, I think this is exactly what Ina says what, you know, when you talk about the John Stewart show. Um, and, and when Hillary Clinton called these people deplor the, when deplorable. she had this, <laughs> this word, the deplorables, uh, yes, we didn't see uh, the vote for Trump coming and... Um, and when it happened, we thought, uh oh, we should have, you know, pay more attention to <laughs> these people that some, mm. some uh, mm. candidates call deplorable. So this is the same. And I think this is where I think we all do some self-criticism in, in Western media at the moment. For instance, the Gilets Jaunes also in France. Um, when they started, one of their grievances was they called themselves invisibles yeah yeah and one of their grievances was that they were they couldn't be seen on the media well, that's, that feeds right to nothing. so yeah. on on of yeah. course on on yeah. tv yeah these yeah. are people who were not interviewed and of course in in a paper like le monde i think we give them we interviewed them every mm. electoral campaign but between yeah. electoral campaigns yeah. Campaigns, we forgot about them, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so this yeah. was a wake-up call, I think, for all journalists that we should, as Natalie said, be closer to you know uh, voters as a whole. Now, uh, of course, we can't. It's not the role of the media to to prevent Trump from being elected. An election is an election, and it has you know. Uh, I don't think media determine an election, uh, an election result. But I think it is the role of the media to inform readers of what is at stake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that hasn't been done enough probably in Britain, in, 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 in the US, because, you know, we didn't see... But, uh, you know, this is the role of the media. You invest... You, 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 there is expertise is also part of the, of the job of the media. And, um, you know, to analyze the economic program, to analyze whatever, uh, 
you know, to see if, if I'm sorry to bring it back to Brexit because you're right. <laughs> but you know, what what would be the cost? Uh, you know, because the lies were being used blatantly okay. in yeah. those campaigns, both in the U.S., in Italy, in the U.K. So it is also the role of the media, whatever the political preferences is, to expose those lies. But hasn't that, expertise. hasn't that always been the case, whether we're talking about the media in, in the West, the media in China, the media in Russia, wherever? This is, this is not something new. This kind of so-called fake news is hardly a, a, a modern concept, is it? Uh, no, but social media is a modern concept. Fair and point. so it Fair multiplies. Yes. You know, when it was only, I, I was going to say it's only the sun, but the sun was, I don't know, yeah, yeah. one million copies uh, yeah, at some yeah. stage. Uh, but now it circulates and we can see that we have two parallel universes of news yeah. now. It is yeah. true. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I could see it in the, in, in the US and it's also now true in some European countries, not all of them. Okay. I think in Germany it's a bit different. But... Um, we can see that we have, you know, the mainstream media having their own set of facts, and then you have this other parallel uh, media universe, which has its another set of facts, and that's very difficult to. That okay. that's new, I think. Fine. Um, it, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Rin, and then we'll we'll take the uh, remaining questions. Rin. Just a very short remark, as uh, too much has already been said, but just um, reflecting on uh, Natalie's closer to people uh, concept. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, for a couple of years ago, um, in connection to C Crimea, uh, me and Jill Doherty uh, went down to these Russian-speaking uh, areas in Estonia to find out whether Narva will be next. And, uh, well, actually, the study was more about uh, Russian media influence uh, on Estonian Russian speakers and whether this would influence their attitude towards Estonia as a, as a country and the Estonian government. And uh, what we heard was that, that uh, actually, we introduced that concept to them because they had never thought in these terms. So one thing, if we want to get these closer to these people and get these people closer to, to our government, governments, then we should really talk to them and explain why we think, why we ask these questions, because they say, what do you mean? I mean, I yes, I, I live in, in Russian-speaking information space, but I don't really believe in what they say, and I don't believe in you either. So I think that they are completely living at the same time, they are believing everything and nothing at the same time. And, uh, and the thing is that they do their own fact-checking. They actually, if they are interested in something, they just call to these villages in Ukraine and Russia where their relatives and friends live and ask whether this is true or not. So they don't care how intelligent or quality papers, I mean, uh, anything is. Okay. Right. Um, I'm going to take the next lot of questions. Um, you're on first. Thank you. Uh, Jack Hanning uh, from the Association of Schools of Political Studies. Uh, I'll be brief, and I promise I won't talk about Brexit, even if there are a lot of things I would have wanted to say. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how pleased I am to see this panel. Uh, secondly, to say that my three favourite newspapers are on there, El País, which I read uh, when I can find it, because I live in Strasbourg in France, and it doesn't always get there. The Guardian, which I read on the internet, uh, because it's one of the few papers which is still free, and uh, Le Monde, which I buy every day when I'm at home. Um, <laughs> now, those uh, newspapers are... Uh, extremely good papers, but the truth of the matter is that they're read by very few people. Um, the tabloid papers, for instance, in the UK, you mentioned one million for the Sun. At one point, the Sun was selling, I think, three or four million yeah. copies a day uh, some time ago. Uh, but um, uh, the point I wanted to make is that um, uh, how do people actually get their information? Unfortunately, it's not through your newspapers. Uh, at best, people may be getting a snippet 
on the social media because they'll get the first bit of a paragraph and then they say you have to pay. Um, and yeah. then the That's other true. area where people get their uh, information from is mm. television. Mm. And mm. Uh, the one thing which is lacking in this panel today is a representative of uh, a, yeah. telev a television journalist. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to make one point and then ask you to comment on it afterwards. Um, one of the things which is changing the media today is speed. The speed with which... Uh, information is made available. And uh, the thing which determines what happens between media and politics is not so often what happens in your papers, but it's what happens on these 24-hour talk shows where you get a piece of information which comes, they call in a politician, the politician is asked to react immediately, very often makes a mistake, or at any rate, as a result of that, there's a complete uh, distortion of uh, uh, the news mm. due to the fact that people are wanting to go too quickly. Okay. So I did have a second point I was going to make about lying, but I, did, I said I wouldn't talk for long, so I will pass on to somebody else. Okay. Uh, my name is Arvind Akaria. I am from Yerevan School of Political Studies. First of all, I would like to thank you, Bobo, for bringing such uh, interesting questions to our session and to all speakers for their very interesting presentations, too. I used to be a journalist before, before, coming, uh, before uh, taking post in the uh, Yerevan school. Uh, I was working more than 10 years in Armenian uh, service radio, Free Europe Radio Liberty, Radio Svoboda. So, uh, I, I can consider myself as a member of the family of yours. So follow the situation of development in Armenian media for the decades. And during the decades, Armenian media was not the, the uh, fourth power. It was the reflective power of the executive power. They used that to reflect their position. And, uh, when they use that, they, uh, they work without any responsibility. So um, after leaving the power, they work in with the other technologies. Now social media has become the creator of fake news maker. Okay. Uh, so, and they are first put fake news in the social media, and after that, copy paste in their medias. Right how to prevent that? Is there some regulation? Do you think about that? Has you touched on this? Thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. Uh, gentleman there, please. Yes, good evening. Um, I represent the Ukrainian um, movement of students. I thank the school for this uh, uh, great opportunity to listen to the panelists uh, and for your moderation. Um, uh, talking of... Uh, of uh, of what I think is a relevant topic for my country um, is that um, the Ukraine is almost like a test ground uh, of for post political um, for uh, for these experiments with the, with the society, so the, even the public opinion. <clears throat> for instance, uh, there's a, a, a lawmaking initiative uh, um, about. Uh, there's in, a false information or manipulation of public um, mm, uh, opinion. And uh, uh, the present government, uh, I think, is trading a dangerous path because uh, the um, actual uh, initiatives of uh, the government uh, of uh, Mr. Poroshenko uh, is now the government is not going to ban any any anything, but they're trying to uh, to uh, employ associations of journalists, which uh, certainly harkens back to the Soviet times. Uh, 
Mm, and this is a draft law, but uh, apparently it is being moved for by the new government in the Ukraine. Um, certainly it is very alarming, uh, as we know that after the Maidan we had uh, several very, very um, uh, loud uh, investigations into the murders of journalists, uh, but many journalists are still in prisons and solidarity doesn't seem to work. How could we influence the situation? And uh, this, of course, is also overshadowed by the conflict uh, with Russia and with separatists. Summer elections in Moscow, uh, and of course I was not registered, and when we tried to dispute, to argue this fact, we were all well, we had to spend some time in the cells. And uh, when I was arrested, that was interesting for journalists. But when it comes for searches or for police raids in our offices, that is no longer interesting uh, for anybody. Uh, some of the journalists told me in a very open way that, listen, um, you have those searches twice a year or three times a year. If somebody, someone is killed during those searches, we're going to make a cool report. You just call us. Or if they kill you, you won't be able to call us. Sorry, man. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, listen, sorry for, uh, for the fact that nobody wants to be killed for one report because you can be killed only once. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do we do in this situation when journalists get used to the, to the uh, level of this uh, crackdown, everyday crackdown? Uh, how do we conv convince them uh, still highlighting this problem of this... Uh, uh, violation of human rights. I know that probably you will answer, you cannot do anything with that, but still, maybe some of you have uh, kind of an interesting idea or advice. Thank you. Uh, that's excellent points. Um, can you just pass, oh, you've got, no, sorry, I keep forgetting. That. Anton Veselov, Novosibirsk. Anton Veselov from Novosibirsk. Uh, talking of the news agenda, uh, the two parallel universes uh, that Sylvie mm, mentioned are, uh, still have a, um, a channel between them. And, uh, the, and uh, there's a lot of uh, information coming from uh, social media, from Facebook, from, uh, from comments. Uh, um, and there is this official circle on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, uh, even though uh, if, uh, if a publication doesn't do a fact-checking, fact people who are publishing on their Twitters and Facebooks are maybe doing it uh, in a very thoughtful way like uh, President Trump, who is publishing very consciously uh, and deliberately on uh, Twitter, mm, and uh, uh, some are just uh, publishing without any particular um, aim, and this is just uh, distorting the agenda. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Oleg Slisko, and I represent uh, the Ukrainian Republican movement in the Ukraine. Uh, in these dramatic times, uh, the majority of media are in the hands of the oligarchs, uh, which are certainly um, uh, having a very one-sided uh, uh, approach uh, to both reporting and uh, analysis. And when the Ukrainian citizens are watching, uh, um, watching uh, foreign TV, including the Russian TV, uh, in uh, the Donbass uh, region, there also people are having uh, information from different sources, but the political um, polarization is very harmful to the society because the motives may well be understood, but uh, the sufferings uh, um, of uh, the common uh, people multiply. And um, we are um, conducting uh, public uh, lectures uh, uh, which we started doing after the Golitsino seminar in 2014. We have um, had uh, three public lectures for the freedom of speech already, and 
monitoring of uh, monitoring missions, uh, which we also conduct. Uh, Politics uh, certainly affects people's lives, uh, both nationally and internationally. And when morals uh, is overshadowed uh, by uh, the mm, uh, political and materialistic motives, uh, and when uh, uh, journalism is becoming uh, um, nothing but uh, a domain for money making, uh, everybody loses and uh, the international projects are put uh, in doubt. So the question really is, uh, can there be any counter uh, or any resistance at the international level? And should this be a grassroots movement, or should this be coming, uh, should this be something coming from, from a, uh, in a centralized way? Excellent question. And finally, second row, another one. We have started a, a Russian language publication in Kazakhstan, and we understand what is the strategy of development. When you go online and when you take uh, information from the sources, it's one of the best uh, ways uh, to develop for any media resource, uh, because uh, uh, it's ample information and it's uh, uh, accessible. But do you believe that the mm, news media uh, is in many ways influenced by the owner of the algorithm, be it in the case of uh, Instagram or Facebook, uh, because they may be generating the content uh, at their discretion. Uh, is there a way to in any way uh, work or cope with the owner's uh, policies in places like Google, Facebook, or Instagram, because they are, of course, the owners of the largest traffic uh, pipelines. We have a lot of questions. We have about <clears throat> 10 to 15 minutes. So you, not each of you has to answer every question. So pick your questions. Let me start with you, Pilar. Pass for the moment. OK, Rina. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Sylvie, help me out here. <laughs> okay, I'll try a couple of them. Um, the speed on TV, of course, yeah. These all news channels have transformed the landscape and have a big influence. And we saw that, for instance, in the during the winter of the Gilets Jaunes, that they were part of the whole dispute because they were... Um, showing riots after riots all day and you know and then inviting when they came under criticism they started to invite uh, some yellow vest people to come but they didn't of course they couldn't select them because themselves didn't want to select representatives so it was you know totally sometimes totally uninteresting people so it was a disaster and it is true that in terms of coverage i mean and it is true that they have an influence on the pace of of news but it is true but i think i, I still think that social media has a bigger uh, wait, wait more than 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 TV uh, in terms of influence uh, on 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 news. Um, the association of journalists in Ukraine. So I'm not. I, I'm I'm afraid I'm not totally familiar with the situation. But associations of do journalists are a double-edged sword. So, so it's it's it can be useful in a democratic environment, but it can be also very dangerous in a non-democratic environment. So, sure. for instance, we have. Uh, uh, in France, we have it's not really an association. It's uh, yeah, it is an association which gives the card of journalist. But this card, you, you just have to certify that you earn your income as a journalist. That's all. You you know, there's no interesting. 
political control or or ethical or anything. It's just that you know you you cannot just uh, so so it's um, you also have unions of journalists, of course, which are more. Uh, but if the government creates an association of journalists, yeah, I would be cautious, definitely. Um, <laughs> your question. Um, I think it's a question of education. It's a question of organization. It's both. It, it, it's it's the job of journalists, and it's also the jobs, the job of the political organizations that you represent, to to drum up uh, this this news that you are being persecuted and and arrested, and uh, and so you will be using. You know, you have. It's both. Um, um, of course, uh, my my answer is not cannot be satisfactory. Maybe you'll have other ideas on how to deal with this, but um, it is a question of civic conscience. So, if the journalists don't have this civic conscience, it's true that it is more difficult. But it is also the job of the political organization that supports you to make this noise. You know. Um, Okay, and this the channel between the two universes. I I agree with you. That's that's a good point. Um, I will let. Yeah. Pilar, you wanted to come in on Ukraine. Um, yeah. No, well, concerning the Ukraine, I will try to ask the first question because I am not sure I understood the second. We can talk uh, uh, later. Um, my experience of the Ukraine is, is that uh, this is an uh, immature society, and uh, the, the, the authorities are very immature. And they, they are, they have difficulties in taking pluralism. Yeah? They have shown that uh, not uh, in Poroshenko times, for instance, with different uh, television programs like uh, Sabik Schuster, for, for instance. Yeah, I mean whatever you like or not, uh, the the program. Um, it's it's difficult for them to accept other. Uh, um, uh, points of view, okay. I think, that because they are convinced that they have the, the truth that uh, any, well, try to, to talk, uh, um, well, if you start by the fact that uh, they don't see people in Donetsk like people in, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, I think that has changed a little bit now, but uh, there was a time and it was difficult even to talk about uh, everyday difficulties of people who had remained in Donetsk. In the end, they have accepted that this is a problem, in, in fact, all people. Yeah. And I, I remember that uh, very well. As far as uh, you, um, your question is concerned, I think that uh, we have to make some autocritic, uh, the media in general, it's, uh, because um, uh, new, an item of news, even if, if it is a very good item of news, it, it lasts, if it lasts too long, it, it stops being an item of yep, news. Yep, yep, Dynamics yep. is a very important component of any uh, uh, news. So either you have to solve the problem or you have to kill someone to increase the, the, the passion. <laughs> Otherwise, you will only, the most you can get is a reminder every anniversary, uh, every anniversary that this was this big event and that happened uh, five years ago or six years ago and whatsoever. We, we live through historical times and we yeah. know that at a certain point you have uh, tired, uh, people in your uh, desk are tired of this big, big news every day and it cannot be sustained. Uh, for whatever, I cannot explain the psychology or whatever, but this is how it works, unfortunately. Okay. Rina, did, did you want to make anything? Good? No, okay. Um, Kadri. Okay, Natalie, you're, you have the last word. <laughs> um, the question about how to, how to get journalists interested in, in, your, in, your, in your activities or... Um, there are lots of techniques for that, right? There are many techniques for that. It's, and uh, we have to be frank, the world of information and media today is like a big fight, a big competition for attention, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's fighting for attention. Um, we're all becoming very narcissistic, by the way. You know, we're all <laughs> looking into our, how many likes do we have? And so we're also individually fighting for attention. So uh, it's a fair question. Um, 
I would, uh, and I don't have an answer other than there are techniques to attract attention, and I don't think they go all the way to, you know, doing something absolutely violent and radical. Um, but it's true that journalists have a responsibility, and I think that journalists today, because we are living in a in a, in a period of, um, you know, challenging, let's say, uh, uh, threatening authoritarianism. You know, there is rampant authoritarianism. You know, around Europe and in parts of Europe. And this is, this is the world we're living in today. Um, we have to be beware as media organizations, as journalists, of the boiling frog syndrome. The boiling frog syndrome is, you, you know, the temperature rises, but you don't, you don't notice it enough. And, and then when you start noticing it, you, you're, it's too late. Um, and and we, we're becoming accustomed to this, you know, hysterical uh, news, and we're we're sometimes um, having problems reacting to it in, can, in in ways that should be should be more effective. And I think if we focus a little bit more on uh, less screaming headlines, less clicks, and and a little bit more on um, if we focus less on that, and if we focus more on explaining why things are happening, why is this happening, not just the event, not just uh, the spectacular event, but what is what explains this? You know, yeah. it goes back to my yeah. question about closer to people. I think mm -hmm. we we will perhaps have that answer to you know how to interest people in new ways. Um, about algorithms, two, yes, se two absolutely. seconds. Absolutely, please. Algorithms are, of course, they're part of now our you know infrastructure of how content, I hate that word, content is spread. So it's part of our infrastructure, like, you know, railways and for trains and transportation. So it's like really our, and I think what we will need, and I'm not the only one to say it, and many people are saying it also uh, across Europe, is we need transparency on these algorithms. We need to know how these decisions are made and the big platform providers, the Facebooks, et cetera, et cetera, are not transparent about how these things work. And they are very important because indeed they determine much of how we, as citizens, we consume news. So this is like a strategic question among other questions connected to technology. Thank you very much, Natalie. Look, I think over the... I think over the last two hours, I think we've had an extraordinarily rich and varied discussion. Um, I'm certainly not going to be foolish enough to try and make any broad conclusions, except that I think the combination of in expanding information space, um, diversification of media, uh, spread of social media, um, high technology and low technology, I think means that this subject is going to run and run, and I hope uh, we have a future, a future uh, association conferences um, that we have more panels on this, because I think it's only going to become a bigger and bigger issue. But in the meantime, could I ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, Pilar Bonnet, uh, Rina Kaluran, Nathalie Nougarhead, Kadri Leek, and uh, Sylvie Kaufmann. <laughs> I, have to th I, th I think we have to thank Bobo and we have 